Dear audience, water, food and climate friends, uh, welcome to this 2024 Wo World Water Day seminar, uh, Water, Food, Security in a Changing Climate, here at the Mediterranean Museum in Stockholm. I'm Thomas Rebermark, uh, Director of Swedish Water House at Stockholm International Water Institute. The World Water Day occurs uh, on the tw March 22nd every year. Um, it was established in 1992 uh, by the UN General Assembly with the aim to raising water issues globally. Swedish Water House um, has acknowledged World Water Day since 2007 by arranging half-day seminars like this in collaboration with ver various organizations. The official theme uh, this year is focused on peace and security. And in this seminar, uh, we have chosen to take a closer look uh, at food security and connections to water. As we all know, the summer of 2023 uh, was marked by both exceptional uh, droughts and extreme rain events in Sweden, causing harvests to drop by 30%. Climate change already impacts the, the water cycle, making uh, farming more and more difficult, aggravated by poor water management and practices that lead to degraded soils. Climate, uh, what is inspiring, however, uh, is how much research and innovation has gone into reversing the trend. More resilient agricultural practices are starting to take root, not least in regions that have been affected by droughts and or floods for a long time. There are already many on-the-ground approaches for water-smart farming in Sweden, as well as around the world, that we can learn from. The purpose of this seminar is to highlight the important role of water food security in terms of agriculture, food production and retailing. We especially want to showcase approaches and good examples on the ground projects from both Sweden and abroad that we can learn from in Swedish context and to emphasize the need for international cooperation. Today's moderator is Mats Johansson, expert on water resources and uh, at the Water Framework Directive at WWF in Sweden. Mats is a systems ecologist, ecologist focusing on water resources, agriculture and change, and also has a specialist interest in uh, sustainable sanitation. He has for more than 25 years worked as a consultant and is now leading the program Baltic Stewardship Initiative at WWF. But before we uh, hand over to Mats um, and enter into the realm of the today, a few practicals. Uh, if the uh, emergency appears, there is emergency exits. Uh, just follow the signs. You see the green sign over there and then there's down the stairs, door to the left, uh, when you uh, come out of this room. Uh, other emergencies, go one down, uh, stair down, and you will find the, the more um, personal emergencies being able to balance out uh, as well. You're not allowed to bring any food or drinks into this hearing uh, room, um, except water, which is good. Uh, and this seminar is being recorded for others also to take participate in, uh, in, in that couldn't be here today. So with that, I would like to say warmly welcome, Mats, and please take the lead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, invited to and uh, get the responsibility to uh, keep all the speakers in time. That's what the moderator mainly do, and also ask some questions. So, um, World Water Day holds a special place in my heart. Uh, I've followed all the seminars all over the years and been working with water and for water for many years. Uh, and at WWF, at the World Wildlife Fund, uh, our mission is to build a future in which people live in harmony with nature. And maybe, that's, maybe I could add that to this day when we discuss the theme uh, about water and food security and climate change. Because um, we, people, need food. And uh, the food systems and the uh, food productions, they affect the ecosystems. And the ecosystems uh, is what we are working with at the WWF. And water is, is maybe, maybe the most important connector for all these 
this nexus or these these different topics that we will discuss and t touch on today. Uh, so I find this very very interesting. So um, and uh, fortunately we have. Uh, an array of interesting speakers. We will have uh, group discussions and uh, a few case studies. So we will touch on, in different ways, we will touch on the theme of the day. Uh, so we will have a key pre two keynote pre presentations. Uh, then there will be a panel discussion being uh, with a, uh, another excellent moderator coming up. We will have case studies, uh, which we will learn more about. Of course, we will have break with coffee. And then there will be a workshop for the people on site, being here at the Mediterranean Museum. Uh, there will also be a question for you guys, uh, being online. Uh, so, so don't run away from the computer or whatever you're, you're, you're watching the, this seminar through. Uh, there will be a question for you as well. And when we come back from the workshop, we will we'll have uh, closing remarks from uh, Anders Drottja from, from the... Uh, uh, representing the government. Um, so we'll meet him later this afternoon. So, um, and what you see here uh, as well for you online, there's a question and answer function, uh, and we will have uh, people moderating that and bringing up interesting questions. And uh, uh, there will be more questions in your heads during this afternoon that, than we will have time to discuss. But we will crop these, we will collect these and use them in the, in the future work, which, which we will hear, hear more about uh, um, when, when we enter the workshop. So, um, that's enough for me talking now. Uh, I would like to ask the first uh, uh, keynote speaker, that is uh, uh, professor Jenny Barron, of the, who is professor at agri in agriculture water management at the Swedish University of Agriculture. Um, and her research concerns water management in agriculture. And she's got a particular interest in, in the development and transformation of agroecosystems and landscapes. And uh, working a lot in other parts of the world, uh, as sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. So I'll leave the word to you, and you've got the clicker, so you... Please, Jenny. Ah, oh, well, there's... Well done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, yeah, you do something with this magic. Yeah. Thank you very much for Don't having want. me here today. And uh, I will uh, press on the right button uh, continuously. And please, uh, could you also flag like two minutes, you know, it's yeah. enough now. Yeah. Um, I will move and enter this stage when time <laughs> is thank out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here for this. And this is, of course, also a very special day for me. I've been working with water in different places, in agriculture systems mostly, for the last 30 years. And um, I am uh, thrilled of the challenges that we're facing. And this, as you see on the one picture here, is from Sweden, uh, my home area with the flooded fields um, and, and what this makes farmers do and our other people around in our landscapes do with, with our challenges that we see. I will try to give uh, a little bit of a food system, agriculture, water uh, perspective, which for me and for many of us here in the room today, is at the heart of sustainability, development and climate action. And we have already talked a little bit about the, the, the challenges that we're facing, but uh, I would hope also that we can come uh, to a sort of consensus that there are also a lot of opportunities and synergies in addressing water and agriculture and broadly our food systems going forward. So, so the challenges, and for many you are really aware about this, we have 10 billion people to 2050, so we need to increase our food supplies for everybody to have a fair and equitable di diet. This will require more water into agriculture, one way or another. We have our climate change, we have our biodiversity, diversity at risk, which is also dependent on our water resources, like uh, you were talking about the, the Malin Falcon Mark bloodstream of the landscapes. Um, and we have land and water resources at a limit. Uh, we cannot take more land into agriculture, and we cannot really take more water into agriculture production either. 
Um, there is a complexity, of course. We are a lot of people who are involved, M many actors, private sector, uh, landowners, consumers, and of course, researchers like myself. Um, there are many different ways of using the water that we're competing about. Um, and investments are diverse, policy and legal actions are complex. So, so please, all these problems, yes, but we can also see them as opportunities for synergies. And, and we do have a lot of knowledge, we do have technology, and we have a lot of attention to the issues of water and our food systems, and not the least agriculture. So, so just to coming back to that field full of water, this is what we saw in the news here in Sweden last year. Um, first, we had two months of droughts. Uh, the farmers were very, very worried about their harvest, and uh, uh, especially livestock farmers, because the first harvest was, was completely failing, the one you take the grass, the silage you take in June. Then, um, uh, perfect timing for the holiday season in Sweden. In July, the, the rains came, they saturated the fields, and the harvest, uh, when you are going out with a combine harvest, you really need to have a dry soil, otherwise you damage it for many, many years to come. And this is what happened. Not only did the harvest not dry proper, but also that we damaged the soil in certain places. This was not unique for Sweden. Actually, there was a lot of drought also in the US, and they were very worried about the global food supply because the US is, of course, a big major exporter of food to the rest of the world. India closed down their export of rice. I think it's still in place. I'm not really sure, but they had a, a ban for rice export. Um, uh, for, for many years. And um, this is continuing. I was just down in southern Africa, in Zimba uh, Zambia, to, to take uh, soil samples with my students. And the farmers, they couldn't come with us to the fields because his heart was hurting, because there's a drought. They will probably have very little harvest next year. And we see these variations, and they become more and more prominent in different parts of the world. And it's important to realize that here in Sweden, we rely on water-scarce production regions for 50% of our food. And then 50% of our food is usually from our national systems. So we're very, very sensitive for, for these um, new climate realities. This is uh, an example on what it looks like. This is from our Agency of Agriculture in Sweden. They provide the statistics on production. And uh, you see from 2003 to 2023, uh, the spring sown cereals in Sweden per, per hectare, uh, the yields per hectare. And uh, uh, if you see, uh, 2018 was a major, major drought, and we usually say 40 to 50 percent reduction in yield uh, for, for Swedish farmers. And in uh, 2023, because of this drought and then the wet spell, we had about 30 percent, as, as uh, you said, uh, Thomas, in the beginning. The thing is that, that this is happening much may be much more frequent. If we take a longer climatic perspective, we see that this is happening more frequent, these higher variation in yield. And, and in this 20-year period, we see at least three uh, times that we have these dips in yield. Um, and uh, this is more frequent than our latest assessment at national level that said that we usually had these kind of events once per 20 year. Uh, just as a comparison, other countries are doing similar analysis. This is for maize yields, uh, yield deviation in US uh, for extreme dry and wet rainfall and high and low temperature in the US 1981 to 2016. So slightly longer and a much bigger data set. Uh, but what you can see is that the red uh, uh, bars they show when, when there has been dry, dry and hot, or dry, dry without heat, uh, and the yield uh, deviation from long-term um, uh, 
uh, averages. So you see that they, they have yield deviations because of extreme droughts or dry plus heat of, of uh, 30%, 20 to 30%. But the blue bars, they show when it's extremely wet. So when you have extreme wet conditions, like we had in July last year here in Sweden, we get similar ranges of yield uh, uh, impact, also a yield reduction. And it's not just the amount of yield, it's also the yield quality. Our nutrition is really at the threat when we have too dry or too wet weather. So globally, it's important to remember that uh, we are very reliant on the rain-fed systems, those agriculture systems that only are served by rainfall. And uh, usually these are very common numbers. So uh, the rain-fed systems, about 75% of our crop lands are rain-fed and almost 95% of our grazing lands. And this produces about 60% of our food. Numbers can vary, but these are just guidance numbers. In Sweden, we have 95% rain-fed crop and grazing lands. Um, on the irrigation side, then, we have about 25% of the area globally provide 40% of the food. That's our irrigation systems. But we also have agriculture water management where we have to drain our soils, which is both in irrigation and rain-fed systems, and this is a big investment. Um, and we say about 15 to 20 percent. The data is very, very uncertain, but in Sweden, it's a absolutely essential to have drainage. We have 50 percent of our uh, cropland drained, and only three to five percent is irrigated. So we are very, very sensitive to these changes in rainfall variation. Now, what do we do? Opportunities and synergies. I'll just say a few words. There are many speakers coming behind, uh, after me today, but uh, as a researcher, we, we are facing an uncertain future. So we cannot just, we have to use all the best knowledge we have already, but we also, that might not be enough for the changes we need to put in place for the future. And on one side here, you see the water companies from the, B, uh, from the UK using, uh, you know, these water searching rods. <laughs> the desperate times <laughs> in the water companies in the, in the UK. And uh, we have um, a, a farmer's magazines. I cannot, yeah, okay, somebody might need to. Do you need some help, maybe? Okay, we need uh, scientific evidence to support our new uh, actions. <laughs> um, and there is a lot of evidence out there on agriculture and uh, how we use our water sustainably and climate smart for production purposes and for environmental sustainability. Um, and we have evidence, it's been built up for many regions, um, how we can work in synergy. I would just like to briefly mention two expand, uh, examples or perspectives uh, that we can address the water at the farm production uh, in, a, in a landscape continuum because that's where we find these synergies. And uh, on, on the left-hand side, you see an example from a Swedish uh, typical landscape today where we have worked with uh, best management practices for water quality improvement during more than 30 years. And they, it can look like these water, winter zone fields or buffer zones along waterways, but there is a whole portfolio of actions that farmers do to keep good water quality. What we don't do is, of course, that we don't have a lot of irrigation, for example, when we have a drought, which turns out to be more important, and maybe water storage also not to compete with natural resources. On the right-hand side, is an example of another 20-year in intervention, but this time in India, affecting more than 20,000 farmers, also more than our total number of farmers in Sweden, uh, with uh, catchment management and climate smart actions, both for storage and drainage and irrigation to maximize uh, farm outputs. Investments to adapt. Now we're raving here. I just want to uh, mention that this, this is not for free. 
and we have estimates on how much it might cost. And the more we wait to invest, the more expensive it will be in the future. So uh, these are some numbers that have been presented, like uh, uh, in the range of 40, 15 to 40 billion per year, uh, global estimates in water, water agriculture for climate smart production. In Sweden, there was recently by the Farmers Union uh, presented a, a, an estimate on water investments alone around 5.5 billion US dollars investment only. Then we need to have management on top of that. And this is for storage, drainage and irrigation for the future. So to wrap up, the water management is essential for climate resilience food systems. And we, need, we, we, can, we know what we can do to make sure that we get good, healthy food, good, healthy environment uh, for the future. And agriculture water management, together with soil health, will be essential to stabilize and accelerate production sustainably. We need knowledge and more capacity to make that happen. And of course, uh, investments to take it forward. So I would say thank you very much for having me here today and looking forward to the afternoon's conversations. Thank you, Mar thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, we will uh, have the next keynote speaker uh, coming up now. And uh, Jenny, will, will, we will uh, have her for a question or two uh, in a few minutes. Uh, it's been an, an uh, okay, well, these are the slides that you never got a chance to see. But you could ask Jenny about them. Uh, during the coffee break. Uh, so so uh, it's an excellent start putting our uh, uh, things in, in perspective and I also feel a little bit of urgency after your talk. Uh, so I'm very happy to have uh, Nonette Royo here with us who will also ha help us now. And uh, Nonette, you have spent more than 30 years fighting for the 10-year rights of indigenous communities uh, in the world's principal tropical forest regions. And you're the executive director of the 10-year facility, which is something that I've started to learn about now, really. Did I, as, as a Swede, didn't know much about, even though you're working here. Ask and, um, <laughs> Uh, you have worked uh, alongside the indigenous peoples and local communities to strengthen their tenure. And uh, so, uh, I believe you have the, the one, so I you do. could show your yes. slides. Yes, to the right. And uh, uh, please, Nanette, start. Thank you, Matt. Um, I chose this picture, but it's a little bit too dark. Uh, it's really the, a tropical rainforest corner. And then here would be the oceans, it's broad. And then our personal touch with water. Uh, I chose the word interconnect. And, and what's important with what we're doing today and this week, looking at water, is that climate change is often talked about as a temperature issue and very much about carbon and it's very much about reducing emissions and you know, the technology that requires, the hardware that require, that's required for that to happen. But you can also look at it as a, an issue of drought and an issue of flood. So climate change, climate is an issue of water. Um, and that's a very important uh, element because just here, I feel deeply the connection. Uh, we work with people who live in a place that is very influential for our water globally, and that's the equatorial belt of the uh, world. And that's Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, you have this belt, and if I, I had a map of it, but I said I have to have only three slides. Uh, so this, this belt, uh, is uh, essentially the lungs of the world. It's 1.2 billion hectares, and it is not empty. It's peopled by locals, communities, indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, the 
amazing story that we all know in many of our researchers, and I think that's not uh, unique to the tenure facility, is that over the years, indigenous peoples and local communities and communities in general, our ancestors, have been working around this cycle of you know, perceived drought and, and, and floods. And they've been working deeply understanding the teachings of nature. And this is where I, I feel strongly that here in Sweden, it's not so far away. There are the Samis. There are the Samis and there are biomes that they have managed over time, including forests, but now they've moved, been moved up to the pastoral areas. Uh, in different parts of the world that we work with, we're now in uh, uh, 20, 20 countries, 36 partners working with indigenous peoples and local communities uh, to basically be anticipatory of the moment when conflict happens, when there is a battling of resources. And, and the term, that the tool we use is tenure. And that tenure talks about land management, land stewardship, land rights, collective uh, monitoring, common pool resources. That we're familiar with too. Common pool resource, what is that? It's not anybody's ownership. It's everybody's concern. Therefore, users, owners work together. Work together to address a challenge, to anticipate, to cooperate, to, to be much more proactive and much more local global. So those will be the features of what I'll be sharing with, with you in the next slide, just as an example here is a familiar um, look at a rice field. But if you look at, I chose the picture of Bali because it's a world cultural heritage. And it talks about, it has a name for it, the way it manages it traditionally, subak. And subak uh, is basically a combination of the sacred, the cosmos, the flow of water, the cycle, understanding that. So the runoffs, the absorption capacity, the aquifers, and the ability of communities to organize around that. Uh, so that feature, I think, is not unique to them. It's unique to people trying to understand nature and working together. So this one, there was another slide that actually so, uh, that describe that, that presents a lake and then the different uh, managers of um, their different rice fields. It looks like a mycelium. So you can imagine a mycelium, right, on top of the earth managing water. We can learn from the mycelium, right? So uh, where I feel we can, and this is just Asia, yeah? The part that uh, we've forgotten is the sacred. And last night, wanting to really understand this whole climate story in a way that doesn't just talk about forests and emissions, which we all face, uh, now is the story of an interconnectedness where humans do not extricate themselves from ecology, but enter that space and be part of it. Uh, which means, really, uh, counterintuitive actions, counterintuitive policies. So not just really pure water and my crop and this one. That's good. That's not, I'm not saying that's not good. But look at it more from the, OK, uh, where are we? Where's our forest? Where are the users? Where are watersheds? How are we going to do this uh, in, let's say, what we're sensing as a, a now a boundary that's been, been uh, exceeded? I think last year, I was, Johan Rockström, uh, essentially uh, launched the, the study of the earth boundaries being exceeded. So we are all in this together. So my sense of this is now for us to, to to begin to think what, what principles, because I am not a scientist for water, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, what principles could work that, that could help us, inform us in anticipating what's important. And, and Sweden, regardless of the vulnerabilities, would still be sort of up at the, the better end of the, of the bargain, as we know. Um, and um, so I'm not sure my time, but I would just share the last slide. Uh, there are, there are biomes that interconnect, practically. Forests, um, wetlands, um, estuaries, uh, grass, grasslands, um, 
coastal areas, um, lakes, uh, rivers, they're all interconnected, right? So let we look at it this way in the way we, we do our work. We now took on the marine tenure facility as well so that we do not uh, basically uh, program uh, support that uh, disconnects people or us because do, do, we f we, we're not really donors. We funnel the funds from donors to our partners. That's what we do on land and land care and land tenure. So when that happens, information becomes uh, so important for signals about land use and users, etc. So this would be what I hope would come up from, from this week or today, not to forget those other counterintuitive, um, um, uh, uh, let's say, co cooperation, collaboration, um, policies, and interconnections for, for our water. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mandat. Please stay on the stage. Please stay on the stage. And I would like to have Jenny Barron on the stage uh, as well. Um, uh, Nonet, uh, this, r this really uh, helps me uh, uh, to understand the, uh, uh, that we speak far too little about the indigenous people, the locals, or the people uh, that are really supporting the, the ecosystems and, and, and the wa water cir cycles. Uh, at least for as me being a, a mainly working in Sweden. So it's very important to bring these perspectives in, into, into uh, our, our um, discussion. Um, I would like to, to wrap up this, these two keynotes with, with uh, a question that I direct to both of you, uh, which is kind of a challenging, but you, you know, you're keynote speakers, so... Uh, I, uh, I, well, let's put it this way. It's difficult and complex to discuss these things. There's a lot of facts, a lot of ideas, a lot of numbers and different perspectives that and, and, and also conflicts. And uh, how do we communicate this? And I would like to, to uh, ask you, if you went into this elevator and... Uh, Beside you were this very, impo this very important policymaker that you would like to influence or to make them do good policy. What would you say? What would be your elevator pitch? Help me. Uh, so, so I would like to learn what, what, how, how do we put all these complex things. So you, you, you could breathe, you could think a little bit and then try. What, what, what would you say, Jenny? I would say if you invest in water resource management in agriculture landscapes, you will affect 50% of our land area. You will affect uh, more than 500 million farmers and their farming families and the rural populations. And you have the opportunity to address food security and nutrition. You have the opportunity to do ecosystem service better and you can climate adapt in, in those particular landscapes. So the, it is a really win-win benefit to look at that option. Bing! And then we're at uh, floor number 20. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was very nice. You, you convinced me. Nunet, the same challenging question. What, what would you say? You entered the elevator. I don't know who, who you imagine being there that you would like to influence. What do you say? I would say, well, water is life, and water is crucial in our soil and forests that are crucial in our ecosystem, that are crucial in our health and in our climate health. So invest in water. Okay, thank you very much. What a start of the, this seminar. Thank you much, Jenny. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Nunet. Um, I will now, uh, uh, now I need the technical assistance of Malin, who is really the, the general and, and, and one of the organizers of this. We're going to do uh, a Mentimeter questions, and I believe that some of you, I know some of you have this kind of equipment. So, uh, we'll see, we need to get, uh, yes, to the slides and we you go into menti.com and we need to have a code and I believe 
that you uh, people joining us online this I, I believe this code also will be in the chat so you go to menti.com you use the code 28063713 and then boom it will be a question and then you could tell us what kind of organization that you work in and uh, we have universities and research institutes, in NGOs, national government authorities or ministries, regional organizations, municipalities, none yet. We have private companies, students and others. That's very interesting, others. And I hope, I don't know how many people online, at least we have uh, more than 30 votes, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I'll count to five and then you'll have to make your choice. Yes. So please. Uh, so we are really interested in who you are. Uh, and that is also because there's a session coming with the group discussions. And uh, well, we could see here from the results coming here that we have a lot of people from the uh, University and Research Institute. We have uh, quite a few NGOs. Uh, we also have some governments, uh, private companies, students, but uh, no municipalities. Maybe they are at the, the the competing session that we heard some some sounds from. That's from the from the from the climate uh, seminar being held by with the with the environmental minister at this very moment. Um, so um, we do. We'll have another question. Not right now, that will come. So now you learn this and we will come back uh, uh, to this. So the next phase, now that we know a little bit more about you, is that we will uh, uh, go into a panel session. And uh, unfortunately, Malin Lundberg Ingmarsson uh, is not with us, but we have Sara Greslund uh, joining us. And you're the head of the uh, Swedish Agriculture University Global, the SLU Global. Maybe you say that, and uh, and you have a, been a researcher in, in biology, and uh, you've been working uh, at GEF, the Global Environmental Facility, and uh, a lot of experience this. And so I will leave the word, the 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 word and the sound to you, and to introduce our panel. Okay, you maybe you should have the ma hand mic then. Great. Thank you very much, Mats. Yeah. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, and very interesting panel with us uh, today. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, you to come up. First, we have uh, uh, Katarina Wolf, and we have, yes, please come up. Katarina Wolf, while you are arranging the microphone, I will introduce you. Uh, she's a president of uh, LRF Ungdomen. It's the Swedish Farmers Association's youth section. Uh, she has a university degree in agricultural sciences. And she also runs a dairy farm in the south of Sweden together with her two brothers. Uh, and they took over the farm uh, together in 2018. So it's been a number of years now. Thank you. Uh, and then we have uh, Patrick Strömmer, uh, who is a policy expert in, on civil defense and food security at Livsmedelsföretagen, Swedish Food Federation. And Patrick has worked with uh, different aspects of food security uh, and he's, uh, he was an advisor in the latest governmental committee on food security in Sweden. He has a background in history and philosophy. And then uh, I'd like to ask Sajivan to come up. Uh, he's a researcher in uh, resistance biology at the Department of Plant Protection Biology in SLU in Alnarp, and his research interest is understanding the mechanisms between, uh, behind plants 
uh, stress responses and their biotechnological improvements for better survival and productivity. And this includes uh, tolerance to drought and heat stress, for example. And now we're all in place. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would like to start uh, with a question to all of you. Uh, and if you could uh, give us like, a brief, uh, uh, your, your brief view on this and perhaps some sort of example or so. And I would like to start with, with uh, Katarina when it comes to this question. And it's on um, how could climate and water smart practices be part of the solution for food security? Well, well, thank you for, for uh, inviting me and for being here. Um, I think Jenny talked a bit about the water infrastructure and the agricultural land. Uh, we have four elements, you could say, cover trenching, uh, open ditches, uh, water storage and irrigation. And historically, farmers in Sweden have done a big investment to get rid of water from farming land to be able to produce food. Uh, and that's why today almost 100% of, of cropland is, is drained. Uh, and this is, uh, has been done mostly by using uh, cover trenching, uh, which today are in, in a very big need of maintenance. Um, and this maintenance is going to cost a lot of money for farmers. It's big investments. Uh, and farmers today uh, uh, do farming with very low profitability. Uh, it's an, an economically challenging uh, sector to be in. Uh, and when it comes to irrigation, which Jenny also talks about, and as she said, about 5% of the farming land today is irrigated. Um, and if in a future uh, scenario where maybe uh, drought is a more common uh, phenomenon in Sweden, uh, she also mentioned the report that LRF, the organization I represent, released uh, earlier this year uh, about what the green transition is going to cost uh, farmers. Um, so if, if, if we have a future scenario where drought is more common uh, and we can say maybe 20% of the land will be irrigated, that's a cost of 20 billion Swedish kronas in investments for farmers. Uh, and I think all these uh, examples of smart practices uh, are good, but the big question is who's going to who's going to pay for these uh, smart practices. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. And I think we'll come into that later on today. Uh, so, uh, Sajivan, wh what would you say about how climate and water smart practices can contribute to, to food security? Hi, thanks for the question. So, it was a pretty interesting question and uh, see, uh, as uh, Jenny as well as uh, she told us, like uh, how, how we can effic efficiently or judiciously use the water for our uh, farming practices. So for example, if I can put forward, it's like uh, we all have uh, back backyard gardens. So how we will irrigate that? We'll take some mug of water, just pour it. We don't know how much water is going to stay in the soil, how much water is needed for the plants. So instead of that, Take that similar amount of water or reduce the amount of water and keep it some sort of a drip irrigation or give the water when the plant is needed and adopt the technologies what we have, for example, the soil moisture sensors, which we can clearly get some sort of an understanding what, what level of soil is, water is there in the soil. So give the water judiciously for the plants to utilize it. It's a similar set of uh, question for us also. You are getting sufficient food in the one time a day in the morning and the rest of the day you are not getting anything. So how you will manage the rest of the things? Instead of that, split it up and give the uh, plants at adequate amount at different time points. So it can use the, and absorb the water at uh, different time points and use it in a very judiciously way and uh, can build or go through this type of stresses to a certain extent. So we need to adapt to the latest technologies and uh, support the farmers to give some sort of a uh, sustainable uh, farming practices. Of course, coming back to the whole fund for that, of course, that's a big question. Great, thank you very much. So I, I will turn to Patrick uh, and hear your take on, on this, how, how climate and water smart practices can contribute to food security. Mm. If I knew that, I wouldn't be here today. I would be out there making money and making the world better. Um, 
No, it's, it's difficult. I, I represent the Swedish food and drink industry, and I'm a very bad lobbyist because I always say that water is more important than food. Uh, when, when it comes to food security, it should be about water security as well. Uh, so my main concern is at the moment not uh, climate change or, or weather. Uh, it's bad people. It's 25 months since the full-scale Russian aggression <coughs> on Ukraine. Uh, and Russia and Ukraine were the two biggest exporters uh, of uh, crops. And we had the blow up of the Kachovka Dam uh, mm -hmm. disaster. So I'm, I'm more scared about people than the climate right now. So how do we tackle that? At the same time that we can, we, we obviously need to do more and better things when it comes to invest in, in water supply. Uh, and can I co continue with you then? Uh, you're already men mentioning these yeah. geopolitical developments and how do you think that they, or how would you say that they are influencing Swedish food security at this point in time? And, and uh, any solutions or way forward, ways forward that you, uh, that you would like to yeah, so discuss? Solutions or way mm -hmm. ways forward are probably beyond my mandate here, but uh, you can all guess what, what is needed. Um, it has been two very tough years for the Swedish food industry. Uh, rising energy costs, uh, consumers who are not willing to pay more for the food. So we are squeezed. Uh, the farmers have had uh, tough times as well. Uh, and, and the retailers may be a little bit better. But the Swedish consumers are not used to... Yes? Your mic is not on. It's not on. No. <laughs> Why wasn't it on? Okay. Sorry. <coughs> Did you hear what I said before? Yeah. <laughs> but, not, but, but not the audience back home. Sorry. Uh, I do apologize for that. So, so it, it, it's been uh, two very tough years, uh, and it shows that it's uh, necessary to adapt to the current situation, whatever the situation is. Uh, at the same time, we live in a world where not all people want us to thrive. And that's a tough insight. And, and how do we work? I mean, this is something, this is a reality that you, uh, that you give a picture of, but we still, I mean, we need to work in that uh, reality and try to move forward within this context. Yeah, and of yeah. course, uh, it could be an opportunity for, for Sweden as well. If we decide to increase our production of Swedish food, uh, we could help other people in uh, other countries as well and, and maybe get better food security for ourselves at the same time. But that is going to need uh, investments, of course. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it, is it irrigation or is it drainage? Well, it probably depends, and, and I am quite convinced that the, the single farmer is the one who is best to decide that. So, uh, Katarina, may I turn to you a little bit outside of the planned questions here, but just to follow up on Patrick's, uh, what he said here, and if you, if you could say something about the uh, situation for the farmers with the both these um, uh, climate events and uh, the conflict development that we see in Europe, and if you could uh, just give us some some reflections from a farmer's point of view. Yeah, it's it's been uh, demanding for years for farmers in Sweden, and, and last year, as as we heard before, uh, we had a reduction of yield with thirty percent. Uh, I think farmers uh, have been adapting to the climate for for a long time. Uh, we are the ones who, who faces these these changes first because we were close to the nature and with the nature. Uh, but again, I think. Uh, we're willing to do the changes, and we are prepared for the for the climate adaptation. But we need uh, economical means to make that happen in a much bigger scale if we want to be resilient in the future. And and uh, what changes would you like to see now in the coming ten years in order to enable the 
investments and changes that you want to see? Well, first of all, I think it's important to, to say that, that there's big possibilities <laughs> for, for the agriculture sector in Sweden to, to make their production more resilient to, to climate change. Uh, and unlike other sectors, we, uh, we are part of a cycle and we work with nature, with photosynthesis and, and uh, factors like biodiversity and climate adaption are very central for us prepared, uh, compared to maybe the transport sector, uh, for example. Um, and when it comes to emissions, uh, we also have the ability to store carbon and produce renewable energy in the farming sector. And that's important to remember, I think. Uh, but to reach the environmental goals in Sweden, again, uh, there's a need for, for big investments uh, in the agriculture sector. Uh, and back to the report that LRF released uh, earlier this year together with Lantmannen uh, that explained how much the green transition is going to cost for farmers. Um, you can say that uh, it's going to cost in investments about 80 to 85 billion Swedish kronas and then 10 to 11 billion Swedish kronas every year in, in climate measures. Um, and the agriculture sector in Sweden as a whole has a turnover of about 80 billion Swedish kronas. Uh, and that's how much the transition is going to cost. If you compare that, for example, to the retail trade, where the value of the food consumption is about 350 billion Swedish kronas. Uh, and that for me makes it very clear that we cannot carry these these investments ourselves. Farmers cannot carry these these investments, uh, and I think we need the long term solution. Is of course the consumers have to pay more for for these uh, investments, and also uh, there could be political tools that can help uh, with the climate measures as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and Sajivan, yeah. if we look more into like. Uh, practical adaptation possibilities. Uh, you, you conduct research on stress tolerance of crops, uh, for example, tolerance to droughts and heat waves. Uh, and uh, could you, uh, uh, could, you uh, could you tell us a bit about how knowledge about these <coughs> different drought and, and um, uh, heat and flood tolerant mechanisms, how they have been applied in practice in uh, perhaps in other contexts than Sweden and uh, what, what, are the, what is the potential in that and what can we learn in Sweden from this? So, uh, understanding the mechanism of uh, uh, crops response to these stresses is one, one basket I will say and how we are this knowledge transferring to our crop plants to adapt them to the changing climate like drought or heat or flood or salinity or whatever it is. So that is the major challenge we are having. So understanding this mechanism is one part which we are trying to do it from some sort of a model systems like arabidopsis or small plants. We will challenge with these type of stress in one like small places and try to see like uh, what sort of things are happening there. But when you come to the field level, situation is entirely different there. These plants are not going through one stress at a time. It is like a multiple stresses are coming at the same time. If there is a drought, along with that there is a heat stress coming there. So we need to see what is the mechanism operating for the multiple stresses, not at the individual levels. That is one part, even though we have sufficient knowledge developed over the last many decades, how the transferring of this knowledge to the crop plants will take quite enormous time. Because we have only very few tools in our hand, for example breeding. So to bred a particular trait, trait is nothing but a character in that, for example, drought, we'll call it as a root. So root, if you have deep roots, it can take more water from the soil in the deeper layers if it's a drought condition. So we need to understand which, for example, I'll put it in the context of wheat. So first we need to identify a parent which is having a deep root system and see which are the genes or what is controlling that, that we need to transfer to our commercial cultivating varieties to improve the root system, for example, just one thing. So this will be like through the crossing of this one parent which is having the root system, big root, and the commercial cultivated one. So that will take almost 8 to 12 years to get into a proper variety which can come to the field. So we need to think well in advance. and. Contest of thinking all these things for, I can put forward one of the examples which has uh, come up in Morocco, which is one of the very drought-prone areas, which they, they developed a 
wheat rum wheat variety which is called jabal so that is one of the uh, i can say to the extent drought tolerant variety which the jabal nothing but it's a mountain they identified one of the varieties which they grow in the mountains because all others are dying this is uh, working very good so they tried to transfer the characters what this uh, mountain variety to the cultivated one it took almost like 12 years and it is not just one partner they have multiple partners coming into picture farmers stakeholders researchers so i always believe it is some sort of a consortium sort of stuff and build upon uh, knowledge from the researchers breeders stakeholders farmers indigenous knowledge all these things to come together to get into some sort of a success and coming to the sweden perspective we are seeing so as i told we need to understand and identify the things and these all are geographical localized ones we can't take the morocco one to put it in the swedish condition so we need to identify the cultivars which is having these type of traits in our background and bring that to the cultivated ones so that will take enormous time but we have technologies now it is coming up but we need to have some sort of a open mind to accept the technologies which is good for the future so in swedish context if you are seeing it is we have knowledge we have germ blossoms the thing is time and the funding from the government as well as from the stakeholders so that's that's the two things which we need and the time so we can of course as a researcher can bring down the time from maybe 12 years to 8 years or 7 years we can't come beyond that there is some sort of a time limit we so we need to think in well in advance well in maybe 10 years ahead what is going to happen with our predicted models how the climate is changing how the heat waves are coming up and also another one of the important things at what stage of the plant these stresses are coming into picture according to that that will change the responses will change so we have quite a lot of knowledge developed from all these systems but putting that in the field level it takes some more time and we need to concentrate on more breeding programs localized based on the geographical conditions of that place and sweden we need to consider here we have more light hours so we need to have some sort of a more photosynthetic efficient plants here or you should have like uh, flooding conditions so we should have some sort which could not make the flooding stress to make some sort of a root rot or the root bk in the plants so some sort of uh, tolerance we need to find that so it will take its time but we are into that yeah thank you and and uh, you mentioned uh, uh, certain variety, variety de developed in morocco but Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, improved var varieties that are uh, in commercial cultivation across the world today, isn't, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. I just took one of the examples from Morocco, back to Asia, rice. We have n number of varieties which is uh, improved for drought, heat, salinity, flooding. We have varieties released, but they have, they have well-defined uh, uh, institutes, I can say, for example, rice. we can we all will be heard about um, iri international rice research institute in philippines they have a huge collection of wild varieties as well as the modern cultivated ones so they have the genetic resources to screen understand and how to transfer that so the transferring is the time which we have the lacking yeah. so we need to start in well advanced that we need support from the funding agencies as well as yeah we need to start thinking about this seriously yes yeah Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, interesting to hear you mention also indigenous indigenous knowledge and traditional varieties that have an important role to play here when it comes to the biodiversity and the genetic diversity that we probably will need in the future to tackle climate change right exactly so that's mm -hmm. the one thing which we lost during the last uh, many mm -hmm. years of uh, breeding programs because yeah. we never gone through the cycle so we were always looking at yield so whichever is coming yield pick it that but because of that course of picking or selecting we lost all this uh, characters which is inbuilt in the plant system so now the situation is we are going back to the wild mm -hmm. and now trying to bring that back to the commercial varieties yeah. Yeah. great thank you uh, uh patrick can i get back to you now and i'd like to ask you 
uh, and actually, in fact, all of you, um, if uh, the actions that are needed for climate adaptation, uh, if, they, if you think that they are in line with what is needed for conflict preparedness, uh, and if you can see that there are like, conflicts between these two uh, streams of um, challenges that we are facing, uh, or if there are also synergies that we can harness Ooh. from these. You were... Yeah, thank you for that small and very easy question. Uh, <laughs> um, but on a more serious note, I think that warfare uh, is very bad for uh, sustainability uh, in, the in the short run. <coughs> what we've seen in, in the long run are, of course, new technologies emerging uh, and possibilities. Um, for instance, fertilizers. Very expensive in Sweden. We are importing 100%. And uh, now, uh, after the Russian invasion in Ukraine <coughs> and the price changes, there are commercial viable uh, opportunities in Sweden. Uh, LKAB, they have phosphorus, there are other companies trying to produce fertilizers uh, on Swedish ground now. Uh, we also know that um, uh, natural gas, which in, it isn't always natural, it might come from the North Sea, it might come from Siberia, it might come from a farm, uh, but, but the molecule itself is extremely important to, uh, to get chemicals, mm -hmm. to get clean water, and also to produce food in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So, things are changing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's difficult to adapt to a new situation, mm -hmm. but that's what we have to live with. And in the short run, there will always be problems when you have extreme warfare. Not only the direct problems, but also the indirect problems that affect us here. Yes. That was not an answer, but yeah. I, I tried to yeah. avoid it. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's uh, very good. And it, I think it also connects this uh, uh, preparedness. You're uh, mentioning fertilizers, for example, and that connects with uh, one of the cases we'll hear about later about uh, indigenous or, or uh, domestic uh, production of uh, uh, fertilizer in Sweden, not only through... Um, uh, these uh, uh, chemical production processes, but also through recycling of nutrients from uh, cities and, and farms. Uh, and Katarina, uh, what would you like to say about uh, the like, synergies <coughs> or perhaps conflicts, goal conflicts when it comes to, to climate adaptation and conflict preparedness? Well, I would say that, that a resilient agriculture sector is, is uh, crucial to, to Sweden's preparedness. And someone mentioned before the self-sufficiency level in Sweden, that it's about 50%. Um, and I would say that we all are already adapting Swedish farmers to the, to the changing climate, but we need to pick up the pace since we also have to produce more food in Sweden. That's a, a government decision to produce more food and we need to produce more food. Um, so it's crucial. I don't. I think there's a synergy between a resilient agriculture and Sweden's preparedness. And, and uh, like, uh, geopolitical development has that uh, sort of accelerated the the political will to or the political incentives to work with. Uh, of, of course, yeah. It's, be, it's become very clear how dependent we are on, on important uh, importing uh, to make our our farms. Uh, uh, go around that we can produce food and we're very dependent on other countries uh, and, and there is possibilities to produce uh, uh, these things in Sweden but we need uh, again <laughs> uh, economical means to do that to be able to invest and uh, Sajivan could I turn to you with the, yeah. with the same question when it comes to like the crop uh, crop level uh, would you give some reflections about this uh, the synergies or goal conflicts when it comes to uh, climate resilience and preparedness. Yeah, I always believe uh, climate resilience and preparedness have some sort of uh, intersect. We can intersect in some points. So uh, if you can uh, somehow manage to the basic necessities for water, food and energy to people, then there is no much sort of a conflict or uh, 
we can reduce the eventual conflicts in the uh, future stages. So uh, it is some sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, involvement of uh, many people there, uh, smart um, policies to bring in uh, for uh, making the agriculture more sustainable, um, efficient uh, use of technologies, and uh, help the farmers uh, for uh, getting adapted to that uh, technologies, so thereby we can secure some sort of uh, a, uh, basic needs for the uh, um, resilience, climate resilience to that. So that can reduce always the uh, conflicts in the uh, future, so we can reduce, like the preparedness can be come down there. So always I will, I will say that uh, invest more on uh, uh, research mm -hmm. and understand the uh, situations and uh, try to solve that in uh, well in advance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's a, that's a, a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and uh, finally, I, I'd. Do we have a few more minutes or what is yeah, it? It will uh, uh, run. Short, short <laughs> yeah, okay. But then, uh, then maybe we could uh, uh, end with a, a question that you have, Mats, for the panelists. And uh, uh, we'll see uh, what that is. Yeah, what, what is that? I'm, I'm the guy with the tricky questions, you know? So, um, um, I was thinking about, it's very interesting and we talk a lot about the situation today and what we've learned up to now. But I would like you to to uh, imagine that we meet here again in three years, 2027, celebrating World War Today. Well, three years and a day, because World War Today is really tomorrow. Uh, and uh, then I would like you to, to, to name one thing that has happened, one activity, one policy decision or behavioral change that could realistically happen in three years and that you believe is of a uh, high priority. And that could be anything. And um, who would like to start? This is kind of a, a realistic wish. Maybe I'll yeah. start? So, yeah. so I just uh, thinking like uh, we should uh, implement, if, if it's one choice, it's like I will go for some sort of a national level. Uh, agricultural uh, or sustainable agricultural practices to implement. So yeah. in another three years, we can uh, reach some stage which yeah. uh, that can include so many things, uh, smart water use or uh, changing to the stress tolerant crops cultivation. So some sort of a policy which need to bring it up in the national level. Yeah. In all countries or in specific countries? Uh, I'm talking about the current situation here. Yeah, in Sweden. Yes. Yeah, okay. Other countries also is, can be implemented. They are implementing it in uh, multiple ways. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we'll start in Sweden in three years. Thank you very much. Patrick? Yeah, um, my general wish is, uh, of course, always that uh, more people should uh, learn about the opportunity cost and that there has to be trade offs between different values and wishes or things we must avoid. Sometimes we have to choose the, the lesser bad. Uh, and the next uh, time we meet here, I hope some representative from the municipalities will be here because yep. they provide 90% of the, the water supply in Sweden. Uh, so that's extremely important that they are on board here. And we know that there are huge investments uh, to, to be done there as well when it comes to water and sewage systems. Yeah. I, I believe, um, well, uh, the earlier this week, all the Swedish water companies and uh, authorities uh, had a meeting in Malmö for <laughs> two days discussing water and wastewater. So, so maybe they're tired and not, not <laughs> with us today. So uh, but that's a, a, a very good activity or, or goal. Katrin? Well, I would hope for a, a behavioral change to the next time we'll be here. Uh, and maybe that consumers uh, change the view on how they value food. Uh, be able to pay more for food, buy Swedish food, uh, and that would hopefully increase the, the profitability by farmers, and that would lead to a higher preparedness and also being able to do the green transition. So that would be a, that's my wish in three that's years. Wish, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm just going to myself. Uh, I don't change that much, <laughs> uh, at least not in three years. So, uh, but 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 I agree with you. It's very interesting. You will change in the coming two years. In the two, yes, yes, I've learned. I, 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 I listen to you, <laughs> <laughs> and I learn. So we at least, 
one or maybe all of us. Then we're, we're kind of a, a cluster or a group. So uh, thank you for, for this and thank you for Sara jumping in in, in the <laughs> very last you. minute. Thank, thank you. you all for this panel. <laughs> and uh, if Katarina and Patrick will give the microphones to Nicola and Filippa. And uh, we have a panel uh, discussion check. Now we go for case studies that's also been promised. And we will have uh, two examples uh, that are different, uh, uh, quite different. And uh, we will, they will have be very short. And then after this, we will have a introduction before we go to the coffee break. So uh, I think uh, we need to, uh, I, I would like to have uh, Philippa Möller from Sp Spaudi up on on uh, stage. I said Spaudi, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Spaudi, <laughs> yeah. And um, you are about to show us a, a, a new smart water technology, yes. right? Yes, thank you. Um, hi. Uh, I work at Spaudi, uh, and what do Spaudi do? Uh, the core of our company is a solar-powered drip irrigation system, uh, and it's mainly used by smallhold farmers. Uh, this system can provide up to three times the bigger harvests with just 20% of the water, uh, and this makes these smallhold farmers uh, more profitable and even more uh, efficient in their water use. Uh, and at Spaudi, we speak a lot about future-proofing food production. But what does that really mean? So the best person to talk to you about this would be our co-founder and CEO and our CMO. Uh, they are unfortunately not here today, but they have made a small video, so that's what I will show you now. By 2050, the global population is expected to touch to 10 billion, putting an added stress on food, water, and other natural resources. Smallhold farmers who produce one third of our global food today are crucial stakeholders in future-proofing a global food production system. Our focus is to transform smallhold food producers into profitable, climate-resilient food producers for the future. We see smallhold farmers as impact generators. Without these impact generators, the food production will not increase in line with the population increase globally. They are the only one that will be capable to generate the impact. And when I talk about impact, I'm talking about food to more people. Our innovation can future-proof global food production. In fact, the World Economic Forum has recognized Spaudi as being a top innovator that can create a sustainable and resilient food production system. The impact outcome is huge. We are talking about 200 million profitable and climate resilient future food producers, half of whom are women. This also results in job creation for millions of women and better livelihoods. From Spaudi's end, we are ready to go. We already have the technology. It's out there. It's proven. We know that we can deliver at least three times more food on the same area of land. We know that we use only a fraction of the water. And best of all, we can provide this output with a small, small solar panel in a mobile system that could be hand carried and managed by just one person. The technology exists. The need, of course, exists. Smallhold farmers can be impact generators, provided they have access to the right technologies, to innovation, and to the right implementing tools and organizations to help them make the shift. Importantly, they also need access to finance and governance, like any other entrepreneur.
अमरी सेवा में पच्चीस लाख बहनों संगठन है और हूँ खेती और पशुपालन काम करूँ छूँ जे पहला अमे खेती करता था तो ढाड़िया पद्धति थी खेती करता था जे जयरे जेम रोग वारे पींदा मन वार उत्पादन पर सारू ना मे और अत्य जो स्पावड़ी पंप वापरी है तो अमार एटली मेहनत ही नहीं थती सीधू पा टपक जटलू जमीन छोड़ने जोत हो एटूज मड़ी रहे और जेना नींदामन पर ना थाय रोगों ना आए जे अमे जय धारिया पदार्थ खेती करिए तो खातर ने बधु अमार हाथे थी नाखू पड़त थूं दवा पर पंप से छाटवी पड़ती थी अत्य जे अभी बायोगेस थकी लरी जे डायरेक टैंक में नाखी देवा डायरेक नरी पर चढ़ाई एवं रीते खातर ने दवा आपे थैंक यू Ace, and we'll uh, soon have the possibility to maybe ask a question. And uh, I would like uh, some of the organizers, if there are any questions to to the cases, we, we could see if that. <laughs> so we have Nicola Parfit, uh, project manager at Sanitation 360, that will talk about closing the loop. So this was about uh, water, and now it's uh, about resources, maybe or. Uh -huh. yeah, a bit please. of both. <laughs> uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Nicola Poffitt and I am a project manager at Sanitation360. I forgot to change. <laughs> and Sanitation360 is a small Swedish spin-off company from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, which we've already heard a bit from here. Uh, and we're based on Gotland and also in Malmö in the south of Sweden. And we've developed a method to recycle human urine or human pee and turn it into a solid fertilizer for agricultural use. And farmers can use it with their conventional farming equipment, meaning that they don't need to invest in any new equipment to be able to use it. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to contribute to creating a, a circular nutrient economy and closing the nutrient gap between cities and agriculture. And a bit of a fun fact is that there's enough nutrients in one person's daily pee to produce enough wheat to make one whole loaf of bread. So each of us is essentially flushing a whole loaf of bread down the toilet every single day. And so we want to instead use those resources and turn it into something valuable that we can use to improve food security. Uh, and we're also currently part of a project, uh, an EU project, where we're producing beer from barley that we've grown with urine. And when I talk to a lot of people about this, th there's a lot of disgust involved. Um, but then as soon as we start talking about how food is farmed today, so we use a lot of animal manure, which is animal feces, animal poo, then urine all of a sudden sounds like quite a clean and clever alternative. Um, and that's kind of what I want to show a bit with this illustration. So there's a lot of taboos surrounding uh, recycling human waste, um, but it's slowly getting easier to talk about, which is amazing. Um, so why do we do this? Well, here you see uh, a satellite image of the Baltic Sea uh, surrounding Gotland and mainland Sweden, and it suffers a lot from eutrophication, which happens when an excessive amount of nutrients accumulate in, the water, uh, in water bodies like the Baltic. Uh, which leads to algae growth, and when algae decompose, they consume massive amounts of oxygen. And this completely depletes oxygen levels in the water, creating toxic environments for marine life. And on these black zones in the right photo, you can see the oxygen levels are at zero, meaning that no marine life can really survive there, damaging our ecosystems. And it's often agriculture that's blamed for these emissions, and while it definitely contributes through excessive fertilizer use, which leads to nutrient runoff and leaching, there's also a big issue with nutrient emissions from small and municipal wastewater treatment plants. And so instead, by recycling human urine, we offload wastewater treatment plants, which will lead to less emissions to water bodies. And a bit about the process, quickly. Uh, so. Uh, the founders of Sanitation360 have developed this eco-friendly stabilizing chemical, which we place in the collection tank in urine-diverting toilets and urinals. Because when, we, or when urine exits our bodies, it's, the nitrogen is bound in the form of urea. But as soon as it touches any surface, there are enzymes that break the urea down into ammonia, 
and then a lot of the nitrogen is lost to the air. Um, so the stabilizer prevents that process from happening and keeps all the nitrogen in its liquid form. And then we can run it through our drying system, which use renewable, uses renewable energy or waste heat. And it concentrates it 25 times by evaporating the water, which urine mainly consists of water. And then we can granulize or pelletize the urine. And I'll pass, around, pass them around later, but there's a little bag here. And then farmers can use it with their existing equipment. And so what does this have to do with water? Um, well, we use low flush or, urine di or, low flush or no flush uh, urine dividing toilets. And here you can see to the left our prototype, which we've installed at Via Sud's headquarters in Malmö, which you can visit. Um, and we placed the stabilizer in this gray tank beneath the toilet, and that's where the urine is collected. And then we come in, uh, yeah, collect the urine and turn it into pellets. Uh, and we also use waterless urinals at festivals and events, which is the main way we collect urine. Uh, so, for example, we'd be collecting urine at Valborg in Uppsala in a month. Um, and then recycling urine also really <laughs> reduces the need for mineral fertilizers, which we know is a very water-consuming process and also requires massive amounts of fossil fuels to be produced. The mineral fertilizer industry emits more than the global aviation and shipping industry combined. And we also, by producing our own local fertilizer, like Patrick was talking a bit about, we improve our uh, food security in the case of geopolitical conflicts because Sweden is import dependent on mineral fertilizers. And then also um, the reduction in eutrophication, which creates healthier marine environments and improves water quality. And I know I'm running out of time a bit, uh, but I just wanted to say quickly, this, I got into the topic of urine recycling through my master thesis, where I interviewed Swedish farmers about what they think of potentially using urine as a fertilizer. And all of them were very positive, except there was some skepticism to what consumers would think if consumers would really buy something fertilized with urine, because there's been a decades-long a sludge debate in Sweden, so sewage sludge is also used in farming, uh, but the media portrayal of it has been very negative due to uh, worries of hazardous substances like med medicinal residues and heavy metals, which is an issue, um, but there's also a lot of new research that's gone into it, proving that it's not dangerous for human health, um, even though there still needs to be more um, looking into how it affects wildlife and marine ecosystems. Um, but there are also a lot of new removal technologies that have been developed, making sure that we can remove these from urine and sludge. So I think for, for food consumers to be able to accept using urine and sludge, it, we really need to have a positive media portrayal in Swedish media of recycled sanitary systems. Um, and we also saw how valuable it is to involve farmers, because they're the ones who, can, who are going to be using the uh, agricultural policies and circular innovations in practice. So if they can't Practically, practically implement them. There's really no point in putting so much effort and energy and money into making these, and they're often left out of the conversation in political rooms. Um, and then lastly, urine, after all, is just another fertilizer. So if we just use it like we use mineral fertilizers, it would also cause, uh, cause eutrophication. So it's really important that we also implement new circular farming methods to recycle the nutrients that otherwise would leach out or run off the soil. Um, so there's a long way to go, but we really need to start recycling urine to um, make sure we stay within the planetary boundaries and reduce our water consumption. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think my microphone on. Uh, Filippa, please come up on stage. This is two. Uh, yeah. Is there questions directly to, to the cases? Yes. The, then we need to, we only have one portable mic, so, so or, or is it ah. another one? No, here, here it comes. Yeah. yeah. We have one question that entered a little bit earlier, but I think maybe Nicola can comment on it. it I don't know if it's a question or, yeah, it is, but uh, it, it relates to your presentation. 
So Sweden has to secure more f food. How are the strategies to reduce food loss and waste? Fertilizers are causing several issues with water eutrophication. How uh, is the strategy is shifting to more organic or fertilizer-free agriculture? So it's not directly on your presentation, but maybe you can comment on it somehow so we get an answer here. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Just that, keep it close. Okay. Um, yeah, no, mineral fertilizers are definitely a very damaging industry, but I think it's also important to recognize how beneficial they've been for agriculture, because without them, we couldn't really produce the amount of food we produce today. Um, so I think it's also really important to uh, remember that like, urine is one solution, but it's definitely not a full solution. Uh, urine can replace about 25% of mineral fertilizer use in Sweden. So we still need mineral fertilizers and we still need, say, there's a lot of research going into recycling wool and turning that into fertilizer. And also animal manure, which is already circular. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a, multi, or like a multitude of uh, solutions that we need to be looking at. Um, and mineral fertilizers can also be sustainable if they produced and used in a responsible way. Yeah. Are there any more questions? We have a, a question in the room, maybe for one of the, the speakers. Okay, please uh, tell us your name and where you, your, uh, where you come from. Right, I'm Gösta Melkerson. I come from something called Läkarmissionen in Sweden, it's called, or internationally it's called Element International. We work with a lot of smallholders, we work with a lot of refugee camps, we work in all these places. First question is about the uh, part that you do, the separation of urine. The two questions that there's something else coming out from the back, not from the front. What do you do with that? Um, that's a very good question. So we don't handle any uh, feces. We just focus on urine. Right. Okay. We can help you with that. So yeah. talk to me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, the, the other thing is that the um, the question to you about the. Uh, the harvesting and the growth, and in the video somebody said it could, could make up to three times as much uh, yield from the field harvest. Does that mean it also absorbs three times as much carbon oxide or not? Uh, that I am not sure about actually. I can help you with that. Oh, <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Because you. <laughs> if, if you do that, you can add carbon credits, financial vehicles to it, and you can finance things out in the world, and you can use the uh, 2028 uh, or 20, the Paris Agreement, the ITMOS that the Energiemyndigheten is doing to sort of localize the carbon emissions outside, but paying it from here. So I would like to speak a lot to both of you, and I can take care of the shit. Prom I promise you that one. Yep. Oh, oh that, that, that's a real promise. Philippa, would you, would you like to comment on this? Uh, oh. on the, yeah, uh, I know that we have been as of now, we are working a lot. We're not just doing the, our business is not just the pump. We are doing a lot. We want to establish like almost like a network where these smallhold farmers, where it's like a sustainable and long-term solution. We don't just want to put out a system and then they just use it when they want. We want it to be in the community. We want, it, we want it to be incorporated in the farming community around there. We want them to be able to ask each other for help. And we want them to be able to spread this knowledge further. Uh, so we are working a lot with different NGOs, financial institutions, just to be able to incorporate things like carbon credits and such. Yeah. Well, I also wrote down like five questions on my paper, but but I will not. Uh, I will take them during the coffee break. Well, well, and stand in line, of course, behind all of uh, all of you other guys. Uh, uh, I will give Nicola and Filippa a big hand. Thank you very much for bringing these case studies. <laughs> Extremely interesting. And uh, now we have uh, Marlin Hermansson, who will uh, tell us about uh, uh, what will happen after the break, right? Yes. Thank you, everyone, for your attention this far, and it's been super interesting to, to listen. Uh, I, my name is Malin Wennerholm, and I work at CV Swedish Waterhouse. And um, as you see here, we will take a little break uh, out there in Salongen uh, with some fika. 
And after that, we'll do some group discussions where you can be seated where you want to in groups of three around the tables. And we have two prepared questions for you. And the first one is just to get the conversation going for you to reflect on what your key takeaways are this far. Uh, but then I will tell you a bit more background to the second question. Uh, so since the start of Swedish Waterhouse in 2003, we've hosted about 20 multi-stakeholder groups, uh, which gather uh, stakeholders from different sectors uh, with a common interest to, to co-create new solutions and policy recommendations connected to water. And uh, one example is the multi-stakeholder group on forests and water and landscapes and water, uh, which were active a couple of years ago and that now had led to the initiation of, uh, or several years ago, initiation of the SIDA-funded international training program, locally controlled forest restoration. And this year we will start a new multi-stakeholder group on water, climate and agriculture, which is one of the reasons to the, the theme of this seminar. Uh, and uh, the main focus of the group will be decided by the group members. This is how we always work, we co-create. Uh, but ahead of that, we want to, to gather your input on what pressing issues uh, should be addressed in this group. Uh, so yes, that's what we would like for you to discuss after the break. Uh, and I also want to mention that Swedish Waterhouse will uh, invite to an online workshop uh, later this spring, uh, following up on the input that we get today. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, you can contact me or the other Malin, uh, and uh, we'll uh, try to give you our best answers. And uh, I also want to say that the online audience uh, for you now will have a bit of a break, but we do have uh, the second question for you to answer on Mentimeter. And if there are some issues with the Mentimeter, uh, please put your answers in the, in the chat because we really want to, to gather this input from all the experts that listen in today. Uh, so yes, and we look forward to seeing you back here at 15.05, uh, where we will uh, hear back from you and then we'll hear some closing remarks by Anders Drottja. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lectures has ended, the, all the input. Now it's time for you to drink coffee and then start working. So we really need your expertise and your views on this. And it's a nice uh, starting process that the Swedish Waterhouse will, will, uh, are really inviting all, all of you to uh, take part in now. So um, thank you, Malin. Uh, and uh, so the coffee is served right outside. So you're free to go. So here, here at the Mediter Mediterranean Museum, we have uh, had, a, had a break and discussions. And uh, I can also see that you guys online uh, have also made uh, a few responses uh, on the most important topics to address in this group that we see now on, on the screen. Um, but I would like to, to have uh, some, uh, just a voice about the, the most important topics for the for, for the upcoming multi-stakeholder group. Uh, do I have anyone? I, I did see you discussing, and I also did see you write things down on, on, on your papers. So, is there anybody who wants to, to uh, add in on this, or are you very shy? We're among friends, water nerds, as we are. Yeah, we could go here. Please uh, bring the mic over there and uh, just say your name. Uh, and uh, just add in on this, uh, uh, what the most important topics to address in the group. Right, and uh, I'm Elin Weiler, I work with PharmaS, Swedish Research Council for Sustainable Development. Um, in my group, uh, we had an interesting uh, discussing discussion, uh, and especially picking the young and not so traditional brains on this topic. So thank you for that. So I'm reporting back <laughs> that we kind of thought it was quite um, uh, interesting to look at value chains 
here. And maybe think about the urban versus uh, the countryside restrictions and really look at the urban farming systems and the possibilities it's opening up for circularity. And especially one of the case studies was bringing that up and we thought that was quite inspiring. Uh, one of the other things is that with a multi-stakeholder group, it's quite important maybe to have a quite focused question. Yeah. And, and this is an angle that's up and coming, it's quite trendy. Uh, so it might be nice to explore in that type of setting. Yeah. Uh, did I miss something? We talked about different tech, um, tech solutions like okay. vertical farming, closed loops. Um, eating what you pee, et cetera, yeah. type of thing. So it's kind of, of a hunger, for, was there hunger well. for more knowledge about these new smart solutions. Yeah, and maybe implementing it on a larger scale. Okay. What are the possibilities and what type of change would you need in the social uh, system to make that happen? Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? Uh, or, or, yeah, we, we have another uh, input here from a, from a group. Please say your name. Hi, everyone. So my name is Marlin lundberg Mason. I was supposed to moderate <laughs> before, but there was a train issue. So <laughs> apologize for that. And thank you, Sarah, for doing a fantastic job in the panel. OK, so what we discussed first, some thoughts about the, the first question about uh, uh, thoughts about or take home messages from from the earlier today. And, and, and one thing that was missing maybe was the, that there was a large focus on individual farmers and smallholder farmers, but not so much mentioning the the bigger companies and, and their role in this. So so there is something that could be added in, in a future context when we work more on these issues. Can I ask, when you say the bigger com companies, is that like middle chain, food industry, food retailers, or is it bigger, it could be ag agri the bigger agriculture farm companies? Or I, wh I what, what did you discuss? I think we, did we specify? I think... No. Yeah, yeah, all of them. Okay. Uh, so, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that they also need to be held accountable in these issues. Um, yes. And then uh, two things that could be of interest for our upcoming multi-stakeholder group. One of them is the more mutual knowledge exchange. Uh, we talk about bringing knowledge from the world to Sweden. We're talking about uh, exchanging s uh, knowledge within Sweden. We're talking about uh, indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge and so on. So, so t to exchange knowledge more. Uh, but that's quite vague, so following uh, Elin's uh, advice from before, that might be difficult to do that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anything and, more? Uh, yes, the last point is that, uh, uh, so there is talk about Sweden becoming more self-sufficient, and if that is so the way we are going, then it would be very interesting to hear what kind of water policies that would be involved in such a transition. Yeah. And of course, there might be some challenges. Absolutely. Well, well if, Absolutely. if we are supposed to to produce our own food, uh, totally. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, also, uh, you guys online, you could. It's open still. You could still go into the menti, right? Yes. And write things down. So, you, you, it, 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 yeah, and. Uh, but you do also have the information to contact Marlin and also Marlin uh, that that's, that spoke. Uh, so and give, keep giving your input. It's it's not too late, of course, because the group will and the work will start in a month or, or some or two. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll uh, we have added uh, a thing uh, to the agenda, and that is um, we had the questions online. Uh, uh, Quite a few of them to Jenny Barron. So, so and Jenny has accepted to to well uh, try to respond to to some of them uh, right now. Bring the microphone, and we have Madeleine Fogde from SEI uh, who has uh, picked some of the questions, not all of them. Yeah, that, yeah of <laughs> course we always go for the tricky questions. Yeah, please, please come okay. up here on stage. Yep, Professor. <coughs> okay, yeah. I'm on a test. <laughs> oh, you are on test. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, uh, the first one was directed to you. So um, it would be nice to uh, know a little bit what specific strategies and technology can be implemented to mitigate water scarcity and enhance water efficiency in Swedish agriculture, considering the unique environmental conditions and socioeconomic factors. That's, That's your job. That, that, that is my, part of my job <laughs> yeah. and I would like to say that many of my colleagues contribute into that work as well and what we do is that we find that uh, in Sweden for example we don't have uh, long-term experiments on irrigation and drainage although we know that those are some of our really important climate adaptation strategies so so we we try to build that infrastructure for our research to understand the long-term benefits both from an economic and from an environmental perspective. So that's some of the things we do. Um, but then we also try to learn from others. Um, um, and uh, we work with farmers in our experimental work to try to understand what are technical options and opportunities vis-a-vis -vis limitations and possibly negative impacts on the environment. Yeah, thank you. Now, this is a question which is not maybe more difficult for you to to uh, answer. Um, yeah, a question to Jenny. Yeah. This is a wonderful information that you showed in your presentation, but why can I not see reflection of this in politics in Sweden regarding soil health and investments to improve it? Could you please explain what you see as a reason <laughs> and what could I do as a citizen to push my representatives to act as such? Well, I, I am a researcher, so I'm not really <laughs> responsible for everything, but we do try. So what I do is, of course, that I develop research in response with my colleagues. And the other thing is that we also have a lot of teaching and educate new experts going out into the field. And, and you're very welcome to come and connect to uh, SLU web pages and look for the Water Forum, uh, where you can find expertise in water at SLU around agriculture and especially agriculture and, and forestry issues. And we're happy to share um, information. But what you can do as a citizen is, of course, engage locally in, uh, in, in the water issue in your local council or other organizations. Um, and you can also choose um, how, how you consume of course, and um, we heard that from our farmer association representative. Yeah. yeah. Main wish for the next two coming up. Okay, thank so, you. That's okay, good. that was it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for, for this. Uh, uh, what, what we uh, we just uh, challenge you you to do. We of course uh, will document all other questions and maybe possibly we'll get answers from some of the uh, the, the key um, keynote speakers and the panelists etc and maybe even if there's a, there are links like uh, Jenny said now to slu.se slash vattenforum right um, so use Google um, now we are very happy to have uh, uh, our end at, at the end of the day or this afternoon, we will have Anders Drotja uh, coming up, uh, helping us uh, looking maybe into the future and uh, uh, give us some of the ideas of, of uh, on, on well the policy arena in, in Sweden regarding to to the, the questions that we discuss. And you're the political advisor at the Minister for Rural Affairs, and you have also worked as a farmer. Uh, and you've also been, been working with agriculture in Sweden for many years. So, yeah. please, Anders, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. If possible, you can shut down the yeah. slide. Yes, thank you. Thank you for all the very interesting presentations and discussions here. As already mentioned here today, water is a prerequisite for agricultural, agricultural and uh, also for the competitiveness in the sector. On the whole, Sweden has good conditions when it comes to water and agriculture. The weather we can expect regarding different climate modeling will mean greater fluctuations. 
But compared to, for example, southern Europe and many other places in over the world, we should have good conditions to produce, but with new challenges to deal with. We saw last summer what both exceptional droughts and extreme rain events can affect agriculture and individual farmers. Due to climate change, we need to learn how to deal with both water scarcity and too much water. Therefore, this type of seminar is valuable. Besides knowledge of how to deal with water shortage and too much water, the Swedish agriculture needs investments to adapt their business to the new climate. Investment supports are an important part of the common agricultural policy. And the investment supports for drainage and irrigation systems are examples of important innovations for climate change adaptation. As Nonette and Katarina said, invest in water. Plant breeding is one of the cornerstones for a resilient farming system. Different crops and different varieties differ in their sensitivities to, for example, draught and water logging. A resilient and climate-adapted agriculture needs adapted varieties. The plant breeding center Grogrund has projects that address these issues. The government has recently increased the funding for Grogrund and welcomes all initiatives that increases the, the tools and the speed for the plant breeders to bring new ad adapted varieties to the market. And if there is any question in this issue, please talk to Sajivan. The government, on the lead by Minister for Climate and Environment, Romina Purmukhtari, presented, presented yesterday a new national strategy for climate change adaptation. Adaptation efforts take place in Swedish society at uh, different levels and in many different areas not least within the work with water resources. A resilient agriculture is also very important for the food security, including drinking water. Drinking water supply is a cornerstone of a well-functioning society. Climate change is already affecting the drinking water supply and today and will continue to pose major challenges in the future. The availability of raw water is expected to decrease. There is a risk of changes both regarding the quality and quantity of raw water, as regarding the production and distribution of drinking water. Food security is one of the main priorities of the government and will be highlighted in the updated national food strategy. For those of you who are not familiar with this strategy, I can say that it's originally from 2017, with broad support from the parliament. We use it as a platform when we shape our food and agricultural policies. It sets out a framework aimed at the entire food chain for continued work on developing a competitive and sustainable food chain leading up to the final year of 2030. In the updated version, also known as the National Food Strategy 2.0. We put focus on increased production and profitability with the food supply chain without lowering the climate and environmental ambitions. Water resources are also discussed within the EU. The European Commission presented last week a communication on managing climate risks to protect people and prosperity. Again, thank you for organizing this very interesting seminar with very knowledgeable keynote speakers and panel members. Thank you. Anders, um, and uh, this also kind of connects back to, uh, to uh, the idea of, of policy and the policy arena, and uh, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, so. This, this water and climate change is really a part of, of the national policy. Yeah. It's a fact. We can't just close our eyes and yeah. think it's not there. Because yeah. it's, it's already here.
Yeah. So um, I hope that we, in three years, when we meet again here and discuss this and, and see all the victories regarding water and climate change and, and uh, food security, uh, maybe you will, will come back. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. depends uh, on the vote. 2026. Yeah. Well, 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 you know, you know, it. it well, I guess we would like I, to have I, you I, back yeah, anyway, right? I, I would right? like to. So, so, okay. So, a big hand for Anders. <laughs> so, um, it's time to end the seminar, and uh, please, Thomas. Yes. Thank you, Mats, and thank you, all the speakers and uh, everyone listening in today. I hope you can hear me now, loud and clear. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic afternoon. Uh, it exceeded my expectations, and uh, I've learned and gained new insights in a way that uh, I was hoping for, but uh, you never can take for granted. So thank you, everyone, for that. Um, I would like to say thank you to you, uh, Mats, for being here. And, and uh, we are supposed to do a little bit of a takeaway uh, yeah. thing now. Uh, would you like to, to just bring in your, your takeaways, a few of them from yeah. the, maybe I'll, the main ones? I, would say I started the day, maybe, I, I, I guess I said it, that I had a feeling of urgency, or urgency uh, at the beginning. It's kind of, not panic really, but feeling that this is important and this is now and we need to act and i um and then I, maybe i went on to some hope or expectations or or positive feelings about the future because there are there are a lot of solutions and there's a lot of knowledge going on in sweden and abroad and and we just saw bits and pieces of that today and if we collect all of this the knowledge being being that 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 we that we already know of um I'm getting more positive. Uh, then I, I also take with me this the importance. A lot of people have uh, talked about it. We need to import knowledge, solutions, and and the ways to work from other countries. You know, Sweden's. We yes, we always said we know we should export our knowledge to the rest of the world because we know how to do it. But in these, in these questions, we really don't. So we need to import it. And that's been highlighted by Nonette and other speakers. I think that's very, very nice. And then I would like to end with, with uh, another thing is that maybe we are, I said, water nerds here, or, or at least very interested in water. Uh, but uh, and there's a, a feeling of, of uh, cooperation and, uh, uh, and a we. And uh, coming back to WWF, World Wildlife Fund, our motto is together possible. That's what I like to bring. So, together possible, we could, well, maybe not solve, but at least move towards solving these really complex and, and, and problematic uh, challenges that we have before us. So, and thank you for inviting me to, to be here and learn from you. Thank you for your engagement and your passion in this question. Um, I'm reflecting a little bit, actually not rec regarding this, but I was in Baku last week, uh, attending Baku Water Week, meeting the government of Azerbaijan, and we discussed agriculture, water and food. Um, so it's, it's not only here. I think that broadens the perspective. And, and they are also talking about preparedness, the urgency, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I, think, I think what has given me some boost today as well, as you say. The same reasons is that there is solutions. Uh, but we need to act collectively. Um, and and uh, I also think one of the takeaways today is when, when Nonette said that it's interconnected. Um, I will for long remember Subak and I will find out more about Subak because I think that we need to we have the data, we need more data for sure, uh, we have the science, we have the technologies, but we need to work on, on solutions that are also nature-based and technology-based in combination sometimes, but also individually. So that's one of the takeaways that I think I, I got from today, that there is solutions, pee or poo, whatever it is, <laughs> we can use it and let's do it. Thank you for everyone for being here. And just to mentioning, 
Um, in January, we had a, a trend spotting day, and we are happy to share uh, at, at Swedish Waterhouse. There were stakeholders from all kinds of sectors. It's a little small uh, under Chatham House Rules uh, group meeting up, talking about what we see as trends and and uh, and uh, influences that will affect the the global dialogue or the, the national dialogue, etc. So I, we are happy to share that. If you're interested, we can share it on email after this uh, seminar with everyone attending, but also reach out to, you, to us if you are interested in getting it. Um, and with that, also I encourage you to reach out to the two, yeah. uh, the two main reasons why we are here today and why it has been so, um, so good and, and well done. Marlin Wennerholm, thank you for organizing this in the such a, your leadership in this. It's yes. it's uh, really instrumental. And Malin uh, Lundberg Ingmarsson, the the research and the the, the work you do on on uh, uh, climate mitigation is um, is instrumental in other aspects. Thank you, both of you. It's an yeah. honor working with you. I'm, I'm just. Um, Keeping time, it's one minute left, you know, we need to use it. Uh, there will be a World War Today seminar next year. Definitely. Yeah, of course. Uh, see you then. <laughs> okay, bye. Or maybe at World War Two Week. <laughs> and there will be fika for people here, uh, so we could mingle in fika yeah. and ask questions to all And thank all you experts. online for staying with us and your influence as well. Thank you, bye bye. <laughs>